feeling much better today. Good. Glory to God. All right. A lot of people under the weather. Um, hopefully this air intake will go off in a minute because it's so loud. Um, I want to talk tonight about something that's really important and really basic in the life of orthodoxy. Should I wait for your wife? I probably should. Well, I'll just give a long introduction. I'm good at that. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so for us, you know, when you walk into the church, when you walk into the church, you hear uh, you, you hear the music, you smell the incense, um, and you see all around you these beautiful faces that are. Um, represented in the iconography in the church. That's better. Um, so, for us, you know, this is this is how an Orthodox church is supposed to look. But for people who are not used to Orthodox churches and Orthodoxy, you walk in and you see all these people staring at you from the last few <laughs> centuries uh, or millennia, should I say? <laughs> They're all looking at you, you know, and it can be something that, that for a person who's not expecting it, it's, it's a little overwhelming. And I hear that word a lot, you know, overwhelming for people who are first or sometimes second time visitors to an Orthodox service because we are worshiping with all of our senses, you know. And therefore, when we finish a service, you know, you, there, you should feel a little bit tired. You know, there, there, something's been taken out of you if you're, if you're doing it right. You know, um, and so um, what I want to talk about then is is prayer and the saints, because the saints are depicted all around us in the church, and that is indicative of our firmly held belief that the saints are not dead, but they are alive. Even the language in Orthodoxy, when we talk about somebody dying, you know. Well, let's say, oh, so-and-so died today. But the proper language is so-and-so fell asleep today or fell asleep in the Lord today. Because we confess that when you are baptized, that you die in the waters of baptism with Christ. And then you come out of the waters and you begin to live this life of participation in the resurrected life of Christ. So those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, we don't believe that they you know, go off into some kind of a, a deep, dark, unconscious, and they have no idea of what's going on. Um, we believe that when the saints fall asleep in the Lord, that their bodies fall asleep, right, until they will be resurrected, until they will be renewed on the last day. But that there is a connection between us and them that is uh, not something that is a, it's, it's not a scientific formula that you can lay out, you know. Uh, but there is, this, there is a real relationship between this church militant and the church triumphant. St. <clears throat> Paul alludes to this um, when he says, Run with endurance the race that is set before you, for you are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. He paints this picture, which uh, he, he's, he's, he says this, referring to all the holy men and women who had fallen asleep before, before Christ. And he refers to them as a great cloud of what? Witnesses. Witnesses. <clears throat> which would insinuate that they're watching what's going on. And if you uh, understand the context, he's talking about the stadium. You know, the, the race is taking place. And there is this roaring crowd all around doing what? Cheering. Cheering, cheering on those who are, are running. So St. Paul uh, gives us this picture that when we go in here, for example, and we are praying, that we are not by ourselves. We are joining the heavenly liturgy. <clears throat> that if we could see with our spiritual eyes that what we would see is the walls drop drop back, drop off, and we would see the choir of saints and angels all around us. That's our experience 
that's spiritually, that's what's happening in there. That's, that's the reality. We also hear a reference to the saints alive and praying in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 says, when he, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw beneath the altar in heaven the souls of those who were slain on account of the word of God and on account of the testimony of the Lamb which they were holding. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Until when, O Master, the Holy One and the True One, dost thou judge and avenge our blood from those dwelling on earth? So they're, they're crying out and saying, how long, the other translation is, how long, O Lord? So I remember when we were having a conversation in my, uh, <clears throat> at my Calvinist college, and <clears throat> we were talking about, you know, the intercession of the saints, and I referred to this passage, and the professor says, he was brilliant, he says, well, just a minute, let, let me get my Bible, let's open up, and we'll read it together. And so he opened his Bible, and he began reading, and he's reading out loud, and it says, you know, they were under the altar, and then they cried out with a loud voice, and said this, and I said, so they're alive, right? He says, yes. I said, and they appear to be praying. He says, they appear to be praying. I said, yes. So I said, okay. So I said, well, what do we do with that? He says, I don't know. <laughs> and then he moved on to something else. Because we don't it didn't fit the theology. It didn't fit the theology. And so they, and I love him. By, Dr. Byron Curtis. He's an amazing man. I still hope to this I hope he'll become Orthodox. He's amazing. Um, well, you remember the guy, uh, who is it? Uh, oh, oh, the bad guy in Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Moriarty. Everybody watched the new Sherlock Holmes movies, the newer ones with in Moriarty. He looked just like that guy. Uh, he had a, a great, you know, trim beard, and he's just brilliant. Anyway, so we have just, this is just a, a snippet, you know, we get this little snapshot of what's happening in Revelation, uh, of what's happening beneath the altar of God uh, in heaven, you know. We hear about the incense and the smoke, the angels crying out, we hear about the saints here praying, um, and so for us, it's our, it's our reality. I mean, it's, it's not something that we wonder, could this really be real? And it's our experience. We have so many instances historically, so many instances over the last 2,000 years um, where, we see the, uh, uh, we, where we see the saints actively <coughs> visiting and watching over, praying for, us here, you know, St. Nicholas. I mean, how many accounts do we have of St. Nicholas? I was, what was the one last year? Uh, Conan the Gardener, last, last week. You remember how, just how many sailors were saved at sea by Conan who appeared to them in the waves and helped them get, you know, away from the rocks. And there's just so many accounts and, and from our contemporary saints, you know. And probably chances are pretty good that some of you know somebody to whom a saint has appeared. Um, or, or somebody who's had miraculous experience with the intercessions of the saints. <clears throat> I, had a, I had a couple of miraculous experiences. I had one where um, my father had passed away, and a couple people had said they saw him standing at the altar, you know, on different times, standing on the left side of the altar. You know, I'm, I'm standing here, and he's over here. And... I, I'm, I don't know, three, four, four times people had said, your father was at the altar today. I didn't see him. And so one day I'm having the worst day of my life. It was one of the worst days of my life. And I'm standing here at liturgy, and, and literally, if I can use this language, all hell was breaking loose in the parish. I mean, it was just, it was, it was our parish's worst day in history. And I didn't know what to do about it or how to fix it, how to confront it, how to anything. And so I'm standing there at the altar. We're about to begin the liturgy. And I am so, I'm so just disturbed, you know. I'm like, Lord, have mercy. And I'm praying. And, I'm, and it just, it hit me. I was like, wait a second. If my father's really standing at the altar, then I'm just going to ask him for help. I mean, that seems simple, childlike, perhaps. I said, okay. I said, Father Peter, I know you can hear me. 
I can't see you, but I'm well aware that you're here at the liturgy. You know what's going on in the parish, and I need it to be fixed as soon as possible before it destroys us from the inside out. And I kid you not, by the end of the liturgy, the problem was solved. It happened during the liturgy that the problem was solved. Well, that sounds like a fluke. Yeah, you're, that sounds terrible. Isn't that a crazy coincidence? Um, that happened some other times, like when my knee was healed at the icon of the Feotokos. I was over in Israel, and I, I blew my knee out running down Mas uh, Masada, and I thought it'd be fun to run down instead of taking the tram down, you know? And so my friends and I ran down, and I took a bad step, and I couldn't even bend my knee. And so uh, woke up in the morning, and everybody, it was, I was just, it was awful. And everybody was all, you know, just swollen and stiff. And everybody in my party was going off into the desert to go visit another monastery. And so there was this weeping icon of the Theotokos. It, it wept during the Six Day War. And um, it, was, it, was, it was this renowned, weeping, uh, miracle-working icon of the Theotokos that uh, th there were just countless miracles attributed to people praying, at, at asking the Theotokos for prayers at this icon. And so I got this crazy idea. You could only get to it if you knew somebody who had the key to this, this, this um, chapel, the chapel of the 40 Holy Martyrs of Sebast. It was under lock and key. And we, thankfully, we knew somebody who had a key, a priest. And so I drug myself out of bed while they're all off in the, uh, in the desert. And I drug myself to a cab. And I got in. And I said, you know, take me to Jerusalem. And so they took me to Jerusalem. And to the, I went to hobble to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, I got the key from the priest, and uh, he opened everything up for me, and I went back, and I hobble in there, and I can't even kneel, because I can't bend my knee, right? So I'm just kind of like this, you know, in front of the icon, like Tom, when he's having a bad knee day. <laughs> God bless Tom, I know. We need to get you over to I'm Jerusalem. I'm relating to it. I'm going to Jerusalem. We're going to get you that chapel. And, uh, so anyway, so I'm just kind of trying to kneel, and I can't really kneel, and, and I don't even know what to say. I, I feel so stupid, because I'm like, I'm standing here, I'm asking, I'm, I can't see her, I see her icon, you know, I'm, I was just, I was a young, a young man, and I, I thought, this is really embarrassing, why did I come over here? And so as I'm sitting there, you know, with my swollen fat knee, uh, I, I just said, Mary Theotokos. I don't even know how to ask for your help, but I'm on the other side of the world, and I'm trying to have this great pilgrimage out here and grow in my faith, and I can't even walk because I've got this leg problem. And everybody says that this is where I should come and pray if I need a miracle. So I don't even know how to ask you for help, but that's I'm just asking you to help me. And so then I, you know, hobbled back the cab, got, going back to the monastery. Uh, by this time, it's, you know, toward the end of the day, we have vespers and dinner and go to sleep early. Everybody goes to sleep early at the monastery. And in the morning, we, oh, we uh, woke up and I sprung out of bed and I said, where are we going today? And the priest said, Father, he said, no, I wasn't Father Peter. They said, Peter John, sit down. You're going to hurt yourself. I said, no, I'm not. And he says, what about your knee? And I looked at my knee, no more swelling, no more stiff, it's and it's just totally it's healed. Not. You know, and I said, I said, I went to that icon of the Theotokos, the weeping one that everybody said was miraculous, and I asked her for help, and now today my knee is better than ever, you know? Thank and he God. says, that's a miracle. I said, we're in Jerusalem. What do you expect, you know? <laughs> and it was a real faith building. The rest of, my, uh, rest of my trip, it was just this real faith building because it really worked. I asked her for help, asked her to intercede, and she did, and I got healed. Uh, and I got to spend the rest of the trip going and visiting all these holy sites. It was amazing. And one other, I'll share one other thing with you. I hate to do this while that thing's on. You should turn that thing off. But I'll thank you. People can get it. Um, when you ask the saints, when we ask them to help us, when they're listening. Uh, and, and they're interceding for us in a real way to God. So... We have these glimpses, again, these, we have these scriptural glimpses uh, that we have, we have the, 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 the history of the church, which is just filled with examples. And then sometimes God allows us to have these, uh, 
the, these, these personal glimpses, you know, and we're always careful. Once that happens, we share it with our spiritual father, you know, because we want to make sure we're not falling into deception or something. Um, but, and, and we don't tell everybody, you know, we don't, hey, you know, Jimmy, you should have seen what I saw last night, you know, because it can build spiritual pride and there's all these dangers and things that the evil one likes to use. But when we, but, it, but praying with the saints is a very, very important part of our spiritual life. Uh, you know, people, some people, you know, like to say, well, I just, I just pray straight to Jesus. Great, good for you. That's great. So do you ever ask anybody to pray for you if you're sick? Well, of course I do. Great. So people, you ask people to pray for you. Okay. So why wouldn't we ask somebody to pray for us who's beneath the altar of God? Or who's in the presence, in the throne room of God? You know? um, who, who, is, who is in the, uh, like St. Saint, Saint, uh, Who's the cook? Euphrosinov. You know, who's in the, who, who's in paradise, you know. Um, so for us, it's, a, it's an important thing. It's an important part of our faith. And it's something that we should invest time in getting to know the saints. I love the lives of the saints. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. And it's not that, there are none of the saints that would take the place of Jesus for me. Right? That's not even a danger. What the saints do is they show us when a person is living out their calling in Christ, what that can look like and where that can go. Um, sometimes, of course, it leads them to martyrdom. Um, sometimes it leads them to, like St. John of Kronstadt, who I like to talk a lot about, you know, to miracle working. St. John of San Francisco, the wonder worker. Uh, so if we follow our calling, if we are on the road to becoming saints, right, which we're all supposed to be, Called to be. If we follow that calling, then we are uh, laying down our selfish will and saying, Lord, you know, give me the strength to go wherever you're leading me and wherever you're calling me. Um, so that's, 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 that's what I wanted to say. And I really, I, I want to open it up for questions and discussion if anybody has any specific questions or discussion. But I'm trying to do, uh, as I've mentioned before, I'm trying to address some really basic principles in the church because in the past I know sometimes we do some really big topics that I find out later people just weren't ready for they weren't right there yet they needed the they needed the milk so we're, we're focusing a little bit more on the whole so does anybody have any questions or comments